Good morning. Welcome everybody to our Sunday morning drive-in worship service at Christ Church Pueblo West. It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning and those of you who are watching and following along with us on our live stream on Facebook. We are very glad that you're here. And so this morning we actually have, and if I had some wood to knock on other than my head, we would say knock on wood that uh, we have almost zero wind. And that is absolutely fantastic. So we are grateful for that, uh, that God gives us a nice calm and sunny morning. Uh, relatively good temperatures for January. We're at about 32, 33 degrees Doing just really well here this morning, and it doesn't hurt that I've got a little patio heater going here, and that, that kind of helps things. And, and you know, it's so nice out that we've had, we've had bushes spring up right here in the parking lot. Um, so i got some greenery uh, here to, to, to look at, and that's, that's kind of a nice addition. Uh, and so um, real quick, I'm going to share some announcements with you. We've got some really some neat things going on to share. Uh, I wanted to tell you that if you are... Uh, looking to hear what we're talk, what I'm talking about, with, hear the music better, whatever, and you're in your vehicle in our parking lot, remind you that we are transmitting on an FM transmitter, which is at 102.9 on your FM stereo in your car, your vehicle, and so uh, you can tune in there. I want to remind everybody that we have started a Bible study on Wednesdays via Zoom, uh, which is uh, an internet um, internet meeting um, platform. And so if you are interested in joining that, believe it or not, what seems to be working out the best for folks is to do it on their smartphone. It works out really well. And so if you are interested in doing that, what I need from you is your email address because then I email you a link where you can connect to our Zoom Bible studies and then you'll be able to join in that way. And we are doing it Wednesday evenings, 7 p.m., it's the Gospel of Matthew, and each week we do one chapter. And so this Wednesday we're going to be Matthew chapter 2. And so if you are thinking that you'd like to join in with us, you're going to need to do the homework because the way it works is we all take part. We all, we all get a, a, a chance to, to voice what we feel like God's saying to us through that particular chapter. And so I would encourage you, I'd like to invite you at home, those of you who are interested at all, to please join us. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to even be in Pueblo West. It doesn't matter where you are. If you want to connect with us and join in the Bible study, we'd really love to have you. Okay, so some of you have seen these before. These are the baby bottles that the A Caring Pregnancy Center distributes, and they have a small slot in the top to put change in. And so I wanted to let you know that these are back. We've had these in the past. And so this, at, this morning, as you exit, when, you, when you're in the process of leaving after the service, uh, we will have these available if you would like one to take it home and fill it up with spare change and then bring it back uh, as soon as you get it full. And you can either just turn it in or you can turn it in. We'll empty it and give it back to you and you can keep refilling it for as long as, as, long as you've got change to continue to to put in one of these, but for uh, what the work that they do at a caring pregnancy center, uh, this is a real worthwhile cause and a, and a wonderful way uh, to do some fundraising where you don't even notice that you're, you're giving because it's just the pocket change out of your pockets. And, you know, last year I think we as a church gave just under $400, and I would, I would like to see us uh, top that this year if possible. So anyway, if, you, uh, if you'd like... Uh, as you're exiting, ask for one of the baby bottles, and we'll get you one. And, and if you don't, if they all if they all go before you get there, which it looks like we have enough right now, but if that were to happen, you could just set a jar aside and just start throwing your your change in a jar. That would work out just as well. So anyway, we've got got those going. Um, then I want to uh, to encourage you, those of you who have your bulletins, uh, in the bulletin this morning there is uh, a. Um, uh, a little blurb here that says Hour for Life, uh, and that's coming up this Saturday at Mineral Palace Park, uh, and it is a uh, pro-life Southern Colorado hosted event where folks come together and pray and, and, and fellowship uh, in hopes of ending abortion. And so I would encourage you, uh, if, uh, if you have the time on Saturday, uh, it starts at 1 p.m. Those of you who are at home and don't have a bulletin, it's at 1 p.m. at Mineral Palace Park in Pueblo. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, goes, 
It doesn't, doesn't say how long it'll last, but I'm guessing hour for life, it's probably going to be right around 60 minutes. Uh, and so it's to, to come together to recommit to the fight to save the unborn, and I think that's definitely a worthwhile, worthwhile thing. Um, our bulletins have connect cards in them this morning, and I would ask that you would take a couple of minutes, pull a pen out of your glove box or uh, from underneath your seat or wherever your pens are rolling around in your vehicle, uh, and you know, give us a comment or two. If you're interested in being a part of the Bible study, you can give me your email address this way, uh, or you can also uh, email it to the church's uh, email, which is christchurchpw.info at gmail.com. And that, that works out quite well. Last thing I've got for you before uh, we get rolling here this morning is that I want you to mark your calendars for Easter, Easter Sunday, uh, this year, we are going to have a sunrise service this Easter right here in the parking lot. And, uh, and at this year, sunrise is at 6.39, so our Easter sunrise service will start at 6.30. It will be uh, a little bit more abbreviated. We will have um, some music. We will have a message. We will also do communion. Uh, and so we will then also, if for those who are not predisposed to getting up before the sun, uh, we will have our regular 9.30 service in the parking lot as well, but we are going to have uh, a sunrise service this Easter, uh, and uh, it will be right here in the parking lot and, and something to look forward to, and, I, and I, I have heard rumors that there will also be hot chocolate available, so uh, it will make it it'll take a little bit of the sting out of getting up quite so early, and it'll probably be, there's a really good chance it'll be a little chilly, so that's okay, it's, it's all worthwhile. So all of those things uh, going on, I'm, I hope I didn't overwhelm you and take up too much time, but I'd like to invite my wife up here to get us started off uh, with some prayer. Good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so today Brian is going to be preaching on what it likes, like uh, who are we in God? He's going all the way back to the beginning and he's going to be talking about, um, he's going to be bringing up some verses from Genesis and it got me to thinking about um, who, who do I think I am and who am I? And uh, oftentimes the first things that come to mind is, well, um, I, I'm a mama and that's a very, very important role and um, I'm a wife and I'm a real estate agent, but for whatever reason, sometimes woman of God or man of God is lower on the totem pole. And so today, as Brian's preaching and as you're going through the week, uh, we need to start putting that up here, that, that we're, you're, you're a man of God or you're a woman of God, and we have to walk through life and walk through our days being an example of that. And um, so anyway, so as he's preaching, think about that and take it into all of your roles. If, you, if you're a mama or a dad and, and as, you're, as you're hollering at your kids, <laughs> as I never do, and maybe think about, you know, what would Jesus do? What would a woman of God do? How would they approach this situation? Um, as a realtor, I do try to, in, you know, whether my clients like it or not, I pray over every single deal. That's the only way I'm as successful in what we do. So take that as you go through this week and, and, and embody that in your heart and uh, use that because I think right now that's what we all need. And that's what the world needs is they need to see more humans of God. <laughs> Even though God made us all, sometimes we don't act like that. So, so put that in your heart, especially this week, as there's going to be a lot going on. And, and uh, more and more, we need to express the love of God and who he created us to be. So pray with me. God, thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are and all that you bring into our lives. And thank you for creating us in your image. Be with Brian today as he gives your message and be with Christy and Haley and Zach as they as we worship you and we praise your name. Be with all those that are here in our parking lot and all those that are traveling this week and all those that are watching at home. Give us a hedge of protection. Watch over us and help us to be exactly who you want us to be so that we can share your mercy and your grace and your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, we invite you.
you to worship and lift the Lord's name on high this morning. It's kind of nice, so if you feel like standing outside of your vehicle and worshiping God out in the open, go ahead and feel free to. Otherwise, lift your hands and worship him. Let's lift his name on high.
presence around you today. what goes on in our world we keep saying it over and over he has it all in control
It is well with my soul. Is it really? <laughs> it should be. When we, trust, when we trust in God to be who he says he is, being well with our soul should be something that is second nature to us. It's something that should be a regular thing. Being calm, being comfortable in who God says he is, even when we're going through difficult times. And that's how it can be well with your soul. So this morning we, we come together and, and we worship and we celebrate. And, and at this point in our service, we, we reconnect. We reconnect with our Savior. We reconnect with Jesus. And you know, uh, there's, there's a lot that can be said for this kind of a service and, and this part of our service. Some folks think that it should happen once a month or once every quarter. But you know, I, I think that we need to do it more often than that. And when we gather on Sundays, we have communion. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. And if, you have, if you're in our, our midst in the parking lot, uh, then we encourage you to take part in our communion service with, uh, with the, the little cups that we hand out that are pre, pre-packaged with our communion elements in them. And if you're at home, a cracker and some juice works just as well to be able to share in reconnecting with Jesus. And so, I want to share with you some scripture from Romans chapter 3. And it says this, Now we see how God does make us acceptable to Him. The law and the prophets tell how we become acceptable, and it isn't by obeying the law of Moses. God treats everyone alike. He accepts people only because they have faith in Jesus Christ. All of us, it's not some of us, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve. And because of Christ Jesus, He freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. God sent Christ to be our sacrifice. Christ offered His life's blood so that by faith in Him, we could come to God. And God did this to show that in the past, He was right to be patient to forgive sinners. This also shows that God is right when He accepts people who have faith in Jesus. And why wouldn't you have faith in the one who came to rescue you? And knowing that God accepts us when we do, why wouldn't you have faith? And one more thing, when you love someone, you're willing to make sacrifices for them. And wouldn't you agree that the greater the love, the greater the sacrifice? Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the fact that you came to make us acceptable to God. You came to give us hope and encouragement. You came to rescue us from sin. And this morning as we pause in our service to do something in remembrance of you by taking communion, may we remember that it is all about what you have already done for us. Thank you for taking our sins and nailing them to the cross. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Sometimes you know God's got a sense of humor. When your fake tree falls over in the middle of communion, it's okay. And so as we talk about level of sacrifice and level of love, Jesus must then have loved you a great deal to be willing to go to the cross for you. And if that's the case, and you've confessed your love for him, what will you sacrifice to display that love? What will you, what will you give up? Will you place your sins upon the altar? Will you turn away from your former self? Because if not, maybe you don't quite understand what it was that Jesus actually did. Because of God's great love for you, a love that flows through Jesus, you have been offered an eternal life. Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from spending your forever in hell when you could spend it. And by the way, forever is a very long time when you could spend it in the presence of God in heaven. This kind of news, this should really get us fired up, shouldn't it? It should have us celebrating. It should have us loving others in radical ways because we've experienced a love that is so radical ourselves. This is why we take communion. To remember and to be reminded of what Jesus did. How it was that he showed his love for us. And each week that we take communion and are reminded, each week we then remember. And I want you to imagine this. Jesus is saying this to you. Yes, I did that for you because you are totally worth it. And he follows it up by saying, your move. What will we do as we take of the cup? May we remember that. Lord, thank you so much for providing the prescription for what ails us, for providing the healing blood of Christ, for providing what washes us clean. In all the cases, all those cases, it's only one thing, the blood of Jesus. We are so grateful, Lord, that you gave us what we need to be considered your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. so at this point in our service, we normally would receive an offering by passing a plate down the rows and that sort of a thing. Well, obviously, as as we are not in our sanctuary right now, we're we're doing things a little bit differently, and we will once again have the offering box uh, at the end of the sidewalk for when you exit the parking lot. You can drive over and and leave your offering there. But I want to share something with you. I I was at a... uh, We've been gathering for prayer... Um, some friends and for about the last 10 weeks uh, to pray for our nation and, and to pray for uh, the end of this virus uh, pandemic and, 
and those sorts of things. And, and you know, it, it occurred to me that this is a real opportunity. And what I mean by that is we have an opportunity to, to be the church to our community. We have the opportunity to be the ones who, in the midst of the craziness, when everybody else is losing control, losing their mind, we have the opportunity to step up and love people and to do it in selfless, radical ways. And so we do that. We, we do kid kits. We do emergency relief food. We, we do uh, whatever we can come up with, a uh, drive through Santa. Uh, we, we do things to engage our community and to let them know how much we love them. And so that continues. And there are going to be more opportunities in this coming year to do exactly that. Quite honestly, God is really blessing us and giving us opportunity and direction and ideas and imagination like you wouldn't believe. And so great things are on the horizon. We've already got some stuff in the works. And I want to tell you it's really exciting. I am just thrilled at, at the way things are looking on the horizon for Christ Church Pueblo West. That being said, what I'd ask you to do is to consider to be a part financially, to be available, to be present in these efforts because there will be no greater blessing here than when you can bless somebody else and in doing so point people to who Jesus is. And I'm telling you, it's coming. There is some great stuff coming and I am wanting all of us to get plugged in for, for what's about to come to Christ Church Pueblo West. And so as we as we consider prayerfully our tithes and our offerings above and beyond our tithes, let us consider that God's on the move and that we want to be right there with Him, moving through it. Let's pray. Lord, thank You so much for all of the blessings You give us because everything You've given us, it comes from You. And we are so grateful for all of the resources that You have provided. And we know that You've got more resources because, quite honestly, nobody can outgive You, Lord. And we are so grateful. And we are in a position where we know that we, listening to your voice, can make a difference right here in Pueblo West, uh, as well as in other parts of the world, because of what you have blessed us with. And so let us keep that in mind always, as we consider what we want to give back to your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I see that we may have... Uh, at least a, a young person or two with us this morning, and, and I, I want to talk to you guys uh, real quick, and I want to ask you, you know, as I always do, I ask a lot of questions. That's, yeah, hi Byron, good to see you buddy. Uh, and, you know, I, I ask a lot of questions, and, and part of that is because I'm actually interested in what you have to say. I'm actually interested in what our young people are thinking. And so, when when we think about that, Byron, when... When you look in the mirror, who do you see? Yourself. Very good. And when you see yourself, do you think, Byron, do you think that you see you the way that other people see you? Cecily, do you think that you see you when you look in the mirror the way other people see you? No. How come? What's different than the way, the, what's different the way you see you and the way other people see you? You think you're not mean, but you're kind of mean. Okay, well, that could be a truth for sure. But, and you actually got the answer just right, Byron, because what happens is you know you better than anybody else knows you, don't you? Yeah, yes, yeah, Cecily says yes. And so when we're talking about looking in the mirror and seeing ourselves, we know who we are, or we think we do, and other people see us differently than we see ourselves. Our parents see us differently, don't they? And our parents see us differently because they saw us before we even remember seeing us. Byron, your parents saw you when you were an itty-bitty baby. And you didn't see you then. And if you did, you don't remember you. But they do. And they still imagine that. Joetta pictures her kids in diapers all the time. She says, my babies. She calls, them her, she calls herself a mama and calls them her babies. They're not wearing diapers anymore, and if they are, I really don't want to know. But she sees them differently than they see themselves. She sees her babies, her children, even though they're taller 
and they're growing up. So when you see you, you see different. Guess who sees you different than even you see you? God. Thank you, Cecily. You're exactly right. God sees us the one real way that we are. And quite often, we get it wrong. We don't see us the way God sees us. And we need to work harder on that. So young people, I want you to pay attention and I want you to think about something. God has the one true vision of you. He sees everything you do. He knows who you are. He knows everything you've already done. He knows everything you're going to do. Nothing you can hide from God. So he sees the real you. And so what I would then encourage you to do is to understand this. The person who sees you the best, that sees you the most accurately, is probably the person you need to be the closest to because he knows the most about you. So you need to get to know him better too, right? Okay, so from here on out, I want you to consider this. No matter how you see yourself in the mirror, God sees you in a way that he could only see you. He says the same for adults. We, we are all seen by God in our true sense, in our true life. And when that happens, we need to get closer to God and we need to understand what that really is. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for our young people. Thank you for our older young people. Thank you for those who have come to hear your word and the message that we're about to share. And may we know that you are the only one who sees the true us, who can see our hearts and know what's in our hearts and how we behave and why we do what we do. We ask that you give us your guidance and your love and that you would bless us and others through us. And I ask your hand upon our young people especially, Lord, that they would grow ever closer to you with each passing day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, guys. You can climb back down off the roof of your car. All right, so one day in 2009... Scott Bolzan was going about his usual morning routine at a company called Legendary Jets, cool name, where he just happened to be the CEO. He was on his way to get coffee, and he stopped in the men's restroom when he slipped on what he thinks was a puddle of some sort of cleaning fluid or cleaning oil. He said, I remember my feet going above my head. That's the last actual memory I can recall. Bolzan woke up in the hospital. His fall caused him to hit his head on the bathroom's floor, and he now has an extreme case of what's called retro, severe retrograde amnesia. Bolzan couldn't remember his name. He couldn't remember anything that happened prior to the accident. He has had to re-meet family and friends while embarking on a journey to relearn his life story and rebuild a sense of self-identity. The best word I can use to describe it is just being lost, said Bolzan, because I lost who I am. On the outside, he seemed fine. But what Bolzan didn't tell anyone was that everything, absolutely everything, seemed foreign. He had no recollection of absolutely anything. Not his wife, not his children, not a single thing in their home. Nothing looked familiar, not one thing, Bolzan said. You know, in my bathroom, I'm sure I showered there a thousand times or whatever, but nothing looked familiar. I started opening up drawers and went into my closets. I just started looking at things, but nothing, nothing looked familiar. But it looked like it would fit me, uh, so then I, I started to rationalize things. Okay, maybe I did live here. Maybe, maybe this is my home. But even more disturbing to Bolzan was that he had no clue who he was. It was just a lost feeling of not knowing where I am in this world and, and who I am, said Bolzan. So that was a very difficult day. Bolzan said that he didn't have any concept of his parents, his wife, his children, family, friends, or relatives. His wife would tell him about his parents, but every time that they would talk about about it, and every time he would sit down with his parents, it was like an interview. He was trying to gather information about what he had been like as a kid, what the relationship was like, and he had no concept, no concept of what husband and wife meant, no concept of what a husband did for a wife or what a wife did for a husband. Scott Bolzan, in one moment, lost 
46 years of his life. That is tragic. But what is more tragic is when someone goes an entire lifetime without knowing who they are. Do you know who you are? When you get up in the morning, hang on here, when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror, okay, that's enough of that. When you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, do you know who you're looking at? Do you know who that is? Oh, sure, you know your name, and you know your family, but you, do you know who you really are? Do you really? This morning we're going to talk about getting things into perspective. We're kind of going down this road of perspectives these few weeks, and we're trying to get things into perspective to when it comes to how we see ourselves and, and how we're intended to be seen. And you know, the way we're intended to be seen is through God's eyes. And we're going to get an idea this morning, a little bit better perspective, not perfect one, a little bit better perspective, if you will, as to who we are in the eyes of the one who created us. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, we read, Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Hmm. Them is us. Them is you. Them is me. So let me come back to that. I want to jump to Genesis chapter 2 real quick to have a look at the process, the process of our creation. In Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 7, it says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, Adam. The word Adam in Hebrew refers to that which comes from the ground because that was where he came from. Now in this particular chapter, in these verses, the Lord, the name Lord, Yahweh, and God, Elohim, are used to introduce himself relationally to to his creation. God made Adam from the same ground that he was to oversee. God also breathed into Adam the breath of life. Pastor Tony Evans explains it this way, that combination... It's astounding. Adam was, at one and the same time, a piece of dirt and the bearer of God's own breath. This shouldn't keep us from thinking, this should keep us from thinking of ourselves either too highly or too lowly. God made us out of the most mundane material imaginable, so we shouldn't be conceited. But God also infused us with his spirit, which gives us a tremendous value. Like Adam, we are all fusion of the divine and the dusty. Isn't it interesting that over the rest of creation, God spoke things into existence. He did that several times. However, the creation of man was handled in a much different way. So there's a couple of things then that we can see from this. First off, the fact that man was created from dust makes him unique in all of God's creation. To create the sun, the mountains, the animal life, etc. God simply spoke. We read, then God said, over and over in Genesis chapter 1. Human life, however, included dust of the earth and the very breath of God. Man is a unique combination of earthly, natural material and life-giving power from God himself. Such a mode of creation highlights the importance and the value of human life. Second, the use of dust suggests a certain lowliness. God didn't use gold. God didn't use granite. God didn't use gemstones to make man. He used dust, a humble substance. So what gives man his glory? The dust or the breath of God within the dust. Genesis 3 
Chapter 19 notes that man's dependence upon God and the fragile nature of human life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. You see, God could have chosen to create humans in any way He desired. He could have done anything He wanted. He could have snapped his fingers. He could have rubbed two sticks together. He could have done whatever. However, Scripture records the particular way that he did it, and he did create both natural material, dust, and supernatural power to give humans a unique place in the cosmos. The recipe of dust of the earth plus God's breath emphasizes the supernatural power of God and the fragile nature of humanity. Human life is completely and totally dependent on God. When's the last time you thought about that? Human life is completely and totally dependent upon God. And as a result, humans are called to worship the Lord and to serve Him only. I want to talk to the guys for just a second. Just a real quick side note, guys. I want you to remember something. We, guys, guys, we're made out of dirt. So no wonder we constantly may be referred to as clods. Keep that in mind. It's okay. You were made out of dirt to start with. You see, God placed Adam in the garden and gave him a job. Are you starting to get the perspective a little bit better here? Is it clearing up a little bit? I hope so. Because... It's important as to who you are and and how you're valued. God, Like I said, God placed Adam in the garden and gave him a job. Adam was to work the garden and to watch over it. Now, hang on for just a second and pay close attention to this. This is very, very important. Before, yes, before Adam had a wife, before he had a wife, Adam had a relationship with the living God, number one, He had a place to live, number two, and he had a job. This was before Adam had a wife. Each of those things are important. So important that before we as men move toward a relationship with a woman, we need to have these things squared away. And single ladies, this is what you need to look for in a guy. You see, falling for a guy who's worshiping the God of video games living in his parents' basement, and jobless, well, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. And young people, are you paying attention? Are you paying attention, young people? God is showing us that there is a process to the way that we should do things, especially if we want to have a successful and blessed family. Some of us adults wish we had understood this before we did what we did. So don't make the mistake. And parents, you might want to put a bookmark in Genesis chapter 2 so that you can go back and say, you see, God shows us a relationship with him, a place to live, a job. Now you can start looking for a spouse. Now Adam's calling was certainly unique, but we all can learn, we can learn about our calling through Adam because he was not just a shared ancestor. He was also the prototype for all of humanity. God asked Adam to to work a specific garden, cultivating it and working the ground and bringing out hidden potential of all that God had made. He was also to guard and protect the things that fell under the umbrella of his responsibility. Man's purview was to manage God's creation on his behalf. Each of us has a garden a God-given sphere of responsibility that God has placed within our care. Whether it's working in business, staying at home, caring for children, or serving the Lord professionally in ministry, God wants us to make His global purpose apparent in our local situations. God won't do the work for you. He wants to do the work with and through you. Now that's so good, I want to say it again. Please get this. Write it down. I even put little lines in the notes section in your bulletins this morning so that you can write this down. God won't do the work for you. 
He wants to do the work both with and through you. It's a partnership. Now, Eve hadn't made her entrance just yet because God had something else to give Adam first. His word. Genesis 2, chapter 16, tells us that God commanded the man. God commanded Adam and expected him to obey. Many men today hate the idea of others telling them what to do. That kind of independence to someone, it may feel like being a man, but God actually measures manhood by a person's ability to submit to the rule of God. A man hasn't arrived at biblical manhood if he won't let God tell him what to do. God had told Adam what not to do, and we know how well that went. Not well at all. God had given Adam a tremendous amount of freedom and allowed him to enjoy whatever God had provided. But biblical freedom, as opposed to our culture's ideas of freedom, well, it actually has some healthy limits. You see, God God gives us guardrails, so to speak, to keep us on track, to keep us from going off into the ditch, just as the rules of a football game help the players and the fans enjoy the game, boundaries in our spiritual walk help us to live the way that God intended. When we misuse the freedom that God has given us, the consequences are severe. Just one bite. One bite of the forbidden fruit. God warned, and you will surely die. Ignoring God's boundaries, it can feel liberating, but it always ends in death. And this is true for individuals, families, and even nations. In chapter 1, God kept saying, it is good. But when he saw Adam by himself, he responded by saying, it is not good for the man to be alone. So he promised to make Adam a helper. The Hebrew phrase used is Izar Kenegdo, which means an essential helper, not a maid. As strong as man is, no man has it all. He needs someone, someone to make up for his deficiencies. A wife is there to be a man's counterpart, equal to him, and adding what he lacks as he fulfills her biblical role. The moment a man says he doesn't need her, he contradicts God. So God addressed Adam's need, putting Adam to sleep and creating a woman out of Adam's ribs. In the original language, the word used for creating the woman is much different from the one that was used for making Adam. For God formed Adam, but he fashioned Eve. When God made man, he took some dirt and threw it together. When he made woman, he took his time. And i got to tell you, I'm really happy about that. Not only did God fashion the woman, but he brought them together, as if playing matchmaker. God brought Eve to the man. Just like Adam, Eve had a relationship with God before she had a relationship with her husband. You getting that? Relationship with God before a relationship with her husband. You see, women who place their hands in the hand of God can trust Him to place them in the hands of the right man. This is the model then for how we're to do marriage. Let's get a little bit more perspective here. God made man from the dust, and he made woman from the rib of a man, and then he brought them together. And these two, man and woman, were made in the image, in the likeness of God. We, you, me, are created after our creator. We are many generations past the dirt in the rib, but it is still our story. We are Imago Dei the image of God. We are, you are, I am. We are the image of God. It is His image that I, that you, that we bear every second of every day. Do you like that you are the image bearer of the creator of the universe? Do you live like you are? I can tell you that there are days when I have almost no resemblance to Him at all. And I know that I've broken God's heart more than once by the way this image bearer has behaved over the last 50 plus years. And I know I'm not alone in that. We've all turned away from God. 
But there's good news. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 that God treats everyone alike. He accepts people only because they have faith in Jesus Christ. All of us. I mentioned this earlier in the communion. All of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But God treats us much better than we deserve, and because of Christ Jesus, He he freely accepts us and sets us free from our sins. Praise God. God sent Christ to be our sacrifice. Christ offered His life's blood so that by faith in Him, we could come to God. And God did this to show that in the past, He was right to be patient and to forgive sinners. This also shows that God is right when He accepts people who have faith in Jesus. You see, God created us. He created us in His image. And we, mankind, sinned and turned away from God right from the start. We are His image bearers, and we broke His heart. But God sent His one and only Son to save us from the eternal consequences of sin. And He paid the price. And that, my friends, changed absolutely everything. Now, when we come to Christ as broken sinners, He exchanges our sin for His righteousness. Through repentance and acceptance of Jesus and His death on our behalf, we are called His children. Hang on for just a second. We are called His children. Quite often I have heard people refer to the children of God as every single person. And that's not the case. We are children of God through Christ alone. It is Jesus that brings us into the family. That's how we become a child of God. Otherwise, we are not a child of God. We are just image bearers. Now, when we come to Christ that way, He does something, right? God no longer sees our imperfections. He sees the righteousness of His own Son instead. He sees that in you and me. Are you getting a bit better perspective here? Is your perspective clearing up? God made us. We blew it. He sent His one and only Son to make things right, or righteous, if you will, and He did just that. And now when God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness covering us. God sees me and He sees you as a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old passed away. Behold, the new has come. It's clearing up a little bit now, isn't it, as to who you are, as to what the perspective is that you should have, that God might have of you. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that Christ, in Christ, we have been predestined for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. This means that God sees us as His child. In Christ, God sees us in love, and He lavishes upon us His abundant gifts and the riches of His grace. Amen. Scripture tells us that God sees us in Christ as an inheritor of heavenly riches. I like how that sounds. Romans. That's in Romans chapter 8. Moving on, God sees us as His own. His own forever. He has sealed us with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it ourselves to the praise of his glory god sees us as his handiwork as his friend and as a chosen one holy and beloved he sees us as dead to sin but raised with christ as a temple of the holy spirit as a living stone placed by the master builder as a part of a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation god's special possession and as one of the foreigners and exiles in this world. God sees us as part of His flock. He is our God. We are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. The perspective that I want you to have is that we are loved so much by God that after our representation of our image of God was tarnished, Our eternity was destroyed by sin. God surrendered His Son to fix all of that. He says, you made a mess, and I can clean it up. So when God looks at you and He looks at me, 
He looks at us through the redemption of the cross. He looks at us through the work of Christ. And not only will He do that for you and me, look at us in that way, He will do that for all who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised Him from the dead. And so, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we know ourselves, we know us. And believe it or not, there's somebody who knows us better. And quite often when we look at ourselves in the mirror and we, we try to gain the right perspective about who we are, we're looking through a whole bunch of junk. Whereas God gets the clear picture. God sees your heart. God knows all that you've done and all that you are. And the best part about it, he loves us anyway. And he loves us so much that he took care of absolutely everything that needed to be taken care of for us to have an eternal life with him. Don't you think that there's somebody in your life right now who needs to hear that message from you? That no matter what they see in the mirror, no matter who they might be to themselves, that God sees them differently? And that God can see them as completely and totally redeemed? Yeah, there really is. And you need to share. When you've been given everything, our parents say, we need to share. When God gave us his son, he also said, it's time to share. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for opening the eyes of our hearts to who you see that we are to who you have made us to be through your Son, through Jesus. Because, Lord, quite often, we are looking through a dirty mirror, we are looking through a lens that is just absolutely fogged over and cluttered with the junk in our lives, with the sin, with the, the whole idea that we need to be more of what the world would have us to be, when actually the true image that, that is us, you see, you see through all of that. And Lord, help us to get closer to you so that not only, not only do we get to know you better, but we can see you the way you want us to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
a child of God. That's what we are when we when we realize who Jesus is and we confess him as Lord and we believe that he was raised by the Father from the dead. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I want to remind you that as you go out, consider yourself sent. Consider yourself sent into a world that needs to hear what you have heard, that needs to have what is in your heart shared with them. And this morning I want to tell you, you are our best hope. You, those of you who are following Jesus, are the best hope for this world. You're the best hope for the people who don't know Christ yet. You are the best hope because the Holy Spirit works in and through you. Keep that in mind this following week, this coming week, that you may move in such a way as to touch a life and point someone to Christ. Thanks for being here this morning. I want to remind those of you who are in the parking lot that we've got the ACPC bottles available as you're exiting over here. And you can grab one and take it home and fill it up and bring it back with some change. And we will do the best that we can to try to to help support this amazing ministry. Thanks for being here this morning. Look forward to seeing you on, on our Zoom Wednesday night Bible study. If you want to be a part of that, give us your email address as you exit or send it to us at ChristChurchPW.info@gmail.com. at gmail.com. Thanks a lot for being here, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. 